Yesterday, I got here and I took the subway straight up to 81st Street, walked across your lovely park, saw two raccoons in a tree, an old oak tree, which made me feel comfortable. Then I went to the Met because two weeks ago, in the Times, even where I live in my little town in Texas, I'd read a glowing review uh, of a show at the Met. And uh, it was called uh, My Soul Runs Deep. And it was a collection of African-American folk art, black folk art in America from Souls Run Deep Foundation, which dispersed a huge collection and gave it to a number of institutions, including your glorious Met, two floors be below the Vermeers, which I also go to see. The catalog was call called My Soul Runs Deep. Your optic convention is called Elevating Photographs. Photographs that matter. For better or worse, I've had the pleasure of working and doing this kind of work uh, for 50 years now. And I can tell you the secret, if there's such a secret, and I can tell you knowing full well that won't probably resonate. But if you look at that work, and I hope you'll go see that show, if you want to elevate your photographs, you want to make photographs that matter? Tell the truth. Tell the truth as you know it. Your truth is different from mine. I come from a little funky place. It's fun to be up here, but not my terrain. Tell the truth as you know it. So let me see how this works. Do I push the red button to go forward? Okay, push this one. I think that we often live our lives around myths, and myths are a certain way to, to tell the truth. So let's just start at the beginning. So boom, the universe is commonly agreed to be 200, excuse me, 20 billion years old. Our own little Earth, our little planet, the poet Robinson Jeffers referred to as only a little planet, but how beautiful it is, is commonly agreed to be 4.7 billion years old. People, much like you and me, appear roughly 200,000 years ago. And representational art, as we know it, shows up, depending on who you talk to, about 50,000 years ago. Symbols, art, notation, making marks, making images, are not new inventions in human culture. They've been with us for the get-go. It's part of our DNA. The Sistine Chapel of Upper Paleolithic Art, the Caves of Lascaux, most of you have heard of them, most of you, some of you may have been. I went to visit it. You have all these glorious, glorious animal paintings. You have all these glorious symbols. Nobody knows why they made them. Arguments abound, theories abound. And one art historian said, well, they crawled down there deep in the caves on their stomachs. They painted using hand ground pigments, using the light from animal fat as a lantern. Perhaps they were our first great prayers. It's probably as good a theme or theory as something more scholarly. In those caves on your left are those handprints. And if you look closely, they weren't like bad children sticking their hands in paint and putting it on a wall. Somebody down in those caves blew pigment around their hand. 
and I make the argument to anybody who will listen that that's probably our first positive negative prince, 22,000 BC. I was here. This means something. I'm thinking something. That's my non-scholarly approach to it. I think it's wonderful. So then you jump ahead 22,000 years and our own beautiful, beloved medium, photography, the word means writing with light, shows up and William Henry Fox Talbot makes the same photograph. Paper and silver salts and light. That's our basis. That's where we come from. Whether you want to do photojournalism, whether you wish to do marine aquatic work, whether you wish to dwell in the uh, world of fine arts, whether you wish to, to document your own life, tell the truth in your work as best you know it. So, Fox Talbot comes up with this process and he writes, only a little magic realized. This is an anonymous photograph from 1839 when we become uh, evolved, so to speak. We don't know who she, it's an American photograph. We don't know who she was. We don't know her name. We don't know anything, but what we can presume is that she and her husband, her children, their children are all deceased but you still have this glorious image, a dark jewel, a daguerreotype, deadly to make, using mercury fumes. You heat them to 180 degrees. She's probably well-educated, natural light from a skylight and a window. You can see where, I call it the jewel box, has been wrapped around there and it's taken out. And she doesn't have that cheesy smile that we love so much in so many pictures. It's like she's looking through time. My only value to you is to tell you the truth, and that's what I see. She's just looking through time. I love those old pictures, and they're great lessons. Even in the gorgeous digital world we dwell in now, there's a great lesson to be learned from revisiting your history. Which brings us to now. You have this tsunami of images. 2.4 billion at last count daily photographs uploaded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can make art out of that. Somebody did an installation piece of all the photographs in 2014, and one day they were uploaded to Instagram. It's another way to present your work. That's your world. That's my world. Let me go back to my mantra. Your best shot is to tell the truth. Make the pictures you want to make. Think about them. And Homie is here to tell you that it's all about making choices. You make them all the time. William Carlos Williams, one of America's great poets, was also a physician by avocation. And he wrote this very famous simple little poem while visiting a farmyard to treat a young woman who was hovering between life and death. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. What if I was gonna pay you $25,000 to be mercenary? And that was your assignment. What kind of photograph would you make? What would you do? What would you do? Would you make a documentary photograph? Go find a wheelbarrow on a rainy day? Would you make a conceptual photograph and go to Walmart and get some ceramic chickens? Would you make an installation and bring in red dirt? and put it all together? Would you make a video? What would you do? It's all about making choices. I have a new book comes out in the fall. I'm excited about it. If you were in my position, you'd be excited too. It's uh, where you have to go through your 
life's work. Uh, I started at 20. Today's my birthday. I'm 70 years old. All my children have called early. It's good. So thank you. But I have some experience in these matters, and like most photographers, I'm opinionated. This is a photograph I made when I was 20 years old in Mexico, walking down a street, a documentary photograph. That's pretty much where a lot of us start, certainly men and women of my generation. The one on the right I made this year uh, in uh, Los Angeles. And what I've learned over the years is we all need the work of other people. It's a fool that works in a vacuum. You need to go to the Met. You need to see what B&H shows. You need to see what your colleagues are doing. If it hadn't been for the extraordinary paintings of Cezanne, we'd have never had the lovely tableau work of Pierre Bonnard. If it hadn't been for the great Irish writer James Joyce, you wouldn't have the extraordinary existential writings and plays of Samuel Beckett. And if it hadn't been for the French primitive photographer Eugene Aget, who worked for 40 years, day in and day out, photographing his beloved old Paris, you wouldn't have Walker Evans, who borrowed every single thing and put it in the American canon from Eugene Aget. I've learned that it's a good thing if you're working on your own on projects that you wish to invest your time and money in is to make friends with uncertainty because he or she just doesn't go away. She just whispers in your ear from a shoulder. That's been done before. Oh, you don't have enough money to finish that. Nobody's going to like that. All kinds of stuff. Tell the truth as you know it. Make friends with uncertainty. Willem de Kooning, here in New York, at the height of his fame, arguably one of the very first superstars in painting. Untold high prices for his work at this time, height of his career, is just riddled with insecurity. Notorious for scraping down his canvases, starting all over. It just doesn't go away. I've learned, even in a small community that I come from, or a large community like you come from, build a community of like-minded people. Open some nonprofit galleries. Show each other your work. Nurture each other as best you can. Start a project. Give yourself two years to finish it, and then move on. And then maybe if you're lucky, Chelsea will see your genius and come pick you up, and life will be another complicated mess. In my world, I work on projects. I give myself about two to three years to finish them. Sometimes they become books. Sometimes they move on. I also worked in the editorial world, like a lot of my colleagues of my age, uh, for a lot of the magazines when they were around. I come from the Texas-Louisiana border, which, as I said earlier, is why uh, I have this strange accent. It's a place forgotten mostly by everybody, except blues guitar players, hurricanes, big-ass mosquitoes. Do you know that term, big-ass? We use it all the time. Big ass mosquitoes. My mom was a photographer. We were a single parent household for all of my uh, out adolescence and most of my teen years. And she photographed children. I grew up around it. She gave me a brownie camera when I was five. And I kept it till I was eight and I wish I still had it. Anyway, I grew up around it. And I started in the documentary tradition. I love black and white work. It's not uncommon of men and women of my generation. Uh, it's like a mockingbird song. You know, the word mockingbird doesn't really 
describe the beauty of that song? Well, black and white doesn't describe the beauty and the tonalities that you often can find in monochromatic work. We all know the glory of color. I agree with that. So I started in the documentary tradition, and then it ended up in capricious ways, say, going into the uh, art world, and then I find out you never know whose walls your work can reside on or whose bed, under whose bed, they have a box of prints that contains yours. You just try to tell the truth. And my bottom line mantra is the full weight and mystery of your art, of your work, rests upon your relationship to your subject matter. What do you want to spend your time on? What kind of project do you want to do? What do you want to investigate? What do you want to explore? It's a different world. It's not photographing flowers, which is gorgeous. It's a different world. Mine's based on where I come from, the animal world, folklore, a lot of black folk art, literature that I've read, et cetera, et cetera. I started out working in my own region and things that I knew of using film, picture called Fireflies, two little boys at the end of the day with a jar of fireflies. Later on, I segued to do the same kind of pictures, but in a different way. But my subject matter in the early part was always the world of children, because my mom had been a photographer of children. Birds, stars, people's relationships. The photograph on the left, on your left, is called Chicken Feathers, and it was made uh, on New, uh, Halloween evening when it just started to rain and ch these children were in a rural area trick-or-treating. Years later, when the Gap stores, this is how things segue, uh, in San Francisco at that time started selling shoes, that's about 20 years ago, they asked me to photograph some of their shoes, so I borrowed one of my own photographs and put a little girl in a tutu in front of my studio door and put 15 sparklers together. And they were of Hispanic manufacture. And apparently they had different fire codes because when you lit them, they just exploded. But it turned out to be a pretty cool picture. And it's all about the shoes. She was fine. So I used this murky world because that's kind of the world that I came from. I still use that murky world. The question is, what kind of world do you come from? What do you want to explore? There's probably five or six of you here that probably have something really extraordinary to say. Probably. Birds, stars, gestures, things like that. Raven jumping on a table, ordinary little miracles, a worn out student in a cafe, little bits and pieces. This is called Holding Venus. I made it in June. And Castor and Pollux are up there to the left, but I spotted them out. Juggling with the moon. One of the little street fairs at night, and somebody juggled. I just moved him. Using the beautiful edges of our medium, whether you use square format or rectangular format, the edges emphasize everything. I started being brutal using edges and using them incorrectly. I started to find relationships in a documentary world where the world was completely ordinary and totally mysterious at the same time small, elliptical, 60th of a second, 30th of a second, 250th of a second, incongruous things, 
It's called the Boneyard. It's in Tucson, Arizona, the world's largest repository of grounded aircraft, which look like wounded anthropomorphic birds. And when ex-military people go there and they bring their grandchildren, it's in the desert, it's immense. They give them radio flyer wagons like they do at zoos to carry them around. Where the world is at once mysterious and completely ordinary. So that's how I've spent a good part of my years, gestures, use of light, edges, oblique angles. An oblique angle is so overlooked, and I swiped it from Eugene Auger, and Walker Evans swiped it first. And that is, if I look at your lovely face and I stand straight here, there are no perspective changes, none at all. You know what you're gonna get. If I step here and I tilt my lens just a little bit, it's still a straight photograph, but the spatial relationships have changed. I use it all the time. It's so subtle that you don't even notice it most of the time, but it changes things. Look at Ajay's work. The animal world. My idea of heaven on earth would be present at Noah's loading the animals two by two, which we all know is a myth, but. Wouldn't that be a great thing to do? Photograph every single species. Or a tourist at dawn and Venice just knocked out. Morning walks everywhere. And then things changed. I lost a sight in my left eye to cancer. I don't say that because it was the world's worst thing. It didn't kill me. It made me see a little bit differently. And my wife got ill a little after that. And she had a four-year illness. I don't say that for maudlin reasons. I say it for, well, I'll tell you. Because I was now tied to my studio for a lot of reasons. And I wasn't gallivanting around looking for lovely things, I was in my little part of the world, my own little space. So I learned a new process, which I think is a useful thing too. If you're stuck, think about learning a new process, getting a new format. Go to the B&H Superstore, see what they have. I learned the wet plate collodion process. I learned a couple of things and I started to work in the antiquarian world where I could just work where I lived all the time, literally. And I decided I needed a project, which is just exactly what I'm trying to tell you guys, if it should interest you. So I decided where I live is like a Darwinian wonderland. It just makes no sense. 15 of the 20 poisonous snakes and subspecies of snakes in North America live in my neighborhood. Four out of the five carnivorous plants in North America live within 40 miles of my circumference. I'm not kidding. I have alligators two blocks away. That's really a kind of a heady mixture. It's an interesting thing. So, I started making photographs partially in my own region, and my idea was my theme, my project, and it's still in progress, is it's a Darwinian wonderland. And I'm going to make it the intersection where magical realism intersects with evolution, where things go awry. They don't go according to plan where people just keep going. I liked it a lot. I could make up myths. A young girl talking to a coyote. It's the Navajos. I could do anything I wanted because nobody's paying me for it. It's fun to do. 
nesting trees. And I could use these processes. You know, with the Canon Digital, it's so elegant. 1.2 lens, boom, wide open. It's just wonderful. With the old Petzval lenses, the brass lenses on the big 8x10 deer dwarfs, or wooden cameras, they only focus in the middle. And they abrade out. And they're gorgeous. And my theory is, we see in short depth of field. If I look at you, you're in focus, but she's not. If I switch, I miss you now. That's how we see. F-22 is a different kind of animal. I started to put incongruous things that I see all the time together. Where I live in the African-American world, there's this legend called the dog ghost. It's found in a lot of mythologies around the world, but where I live, it's morphed into if a loved one dies, and, you're, and it's mostly in rural cultures, rural areas, if a loved one dies and you're in time of need, that that loved one can come back and protect you or help you. And they show up in the form of a dog. And there are all these stories of dogs showing up at somebody's house or cabin uh, with medicine in its mouth or five dollars tucked behind a bandana around its head. You know, things like that. Dog ghosts. So I did a whole book on, pardon me, raggedy ass dogs, not pedigreed dogs. And the things that are so bizarre that go on among my people. And the things that hold us all together whether you're an animal or mammal or each other. Perseverance. Don't you know people that look like that? I do. Anthropomorphic things. I do. Here's one of them. My friend Donald. The beauty that's inherent in time passing in photography, long exposures, color are black and white. We have a, a great many of fundamentalist uh, religions in, in my area, uh, amongst them the Pentecostal. I teach in a university, and I have Pentecostal students, and they've taken a passage from the Bible uh, where they don't cut their hair, and it's a mark of beauty. And uh, So I photographed a lot of them, and I thought they were kind of wonderful or our culture today. Can't get along without your iPhone or Android. Nevermore. The photograph on the left is a portrait I made of my wife in Mexico in 1981, where she had just woken up. She was not amused. I thought she looked really beautiful. And I asked to make a portrait, and she was not amused, and I made the portrait. The portrait on the right is three months before she passed away. She'd been ill for four years. That's a wet plate collodion. To make a wet plate collodion, you take a piece of tin, you cover it uh, with ether, alcohol, and gun cotton, and you have about seven minutes to do everything, then you sensitize it in a nasty chemical, and then you run out, put it in your camera while it's wet, they call it the wet plate. And then you presumably have them focused. She's been sitting there for about four minutes at that point. You make the picture. You run back in the dark room or your tent if you're outside. Uh, and you've probably seen videos of this. And then you put it in a nasty chemical. And you put it in potassium thiosulfate. And, and you do all kinds of stuff to it. And you have one 8 by 10 plate which doesn't look like anything else in the world. Not a lot of women would have stood for that, particularly when they're ill. And I'm not saying that because it's maudlin. I'm saying it's because it's the human spirit in flight. You know, it's a really great thing. So, and I'm almost through, but currently I've come up here from 
North Carolina because I'm embroiled in a month-long project researching uh, the rare book collection of Walt Whitman's letters that they have at Duke University, which has been an extraordinary experience. But what I love about Walt ain't scholarly. What I love about Walt is he said, love the earth and the sun and the animals. Go freely with powerful, uneducated persons and the mothers of young families. And your very life, your very eyelash, shall be a great poem. Why not? And then, to close here, I want to show you what I call a micro-project. I do them all the time. It's like breathing. And you might want to consider this as my colleagues. If you don't want to invest two or three years of your life in some work that you would like to evolve, maybe you want to do like they do in banks in third world countries now, where they give a widow $200 to buy a sewing machine, a micro loan, so she can have a vocation for her family. It's a good thing. I call them micro projects. In my neighborhood, there's a man named Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones lives two blocks from me in two rooms. He walks everywhere. As far as I can tell, he lives on a very small pension. He doesn't have a car. He does not want to take municipal transit. He does not like the bus. And I have passed him walking places for years. So about a year ago, I stopped and I asked him if he'd like to have a ride. And he said, no, thank you. He said, I need my exercises. I said, OK. I said, do you mind if I make your picture? He said, I don't mind. Well, here's the deal. I know Mr. Jones' world now, because that's all I've been doing when I see him, is keep a camera in the car and photograph him when I see him. Mr. Jones always, as I said, doesn't have two dimes to rub together, always dresses well. I think it's a matter of self-esteem and pride. He's a lovely man. He'll stop by maybe once every three months. At the end of the month, I'll, he'll find him on my front porch, and he'll ask to buy five, borrow five dollars till, quote, I get my checks. He doesn't do it very often, and he always pays me back. And I think of it as a pretty good barter system. So it's a matter of self-esteem. It's a matter of pride. And I don't really care to make really nice portraits of him. I care to make portraits of him where I see him. This is after the last hurricane hit us. Neither one of us left, which was an effing mistake, but anyway. I know his routine. He has a three-mile life. You can set your watch by his 7.30 walk to the supermarket to get coffee. I'll find him in the paperback section of the local Kroger, Kroger grocery store. He calls it his library. He reads there. He doesn't go downtown, which is not much there anyway. He walks to the dollar store on 11th Street. He shops pretty much everywhere at the dollar, for everything at the dollar store. And as far as I can tell, and I'm not a babe in the woods, he's relatively satisfied with his life, which I think is kind of a good lesson. I'm not a good example of it today, but I like to dress well, too. Matter of self-esteem. And you know what? 
He's secretly tickled that I'm photographing him. He likes it, and I like it. That's a good micro project. So the very last thing, I had a student graduate and moved to San Francisco, of all places, and worked for a company that, as best I understand it, takes cutting-edge medical research from Harvard, Yale, etc., makes it palatable, rewrites it, and puts it on the web in the medical journals. And he wrote me, and he said, Keith, we had a Nobel Prize winning physicist come talk to our company yesterday. And he said some things that I thought would interest you, kind of the way you think about photography. So here's the deal. If you're stuck, if you're looking for the next step, if you'd just like to try something different, change these words sometimes to photography or change the thought to your project. And he said, for good, quote, research, look in an unexplained region of the landscape. Where would that be here? Failure, which comes to us all, might be an invitation to try something new. Be aware of subtle, unexplained behavior. Don't dismiss it. Understand your instrumentation. Learn your equipment. Back off from what you're doing now and then. Try to gain a new perspective. You might want to take a little time away. And every time you do an experiment, every time you do, I'll use the word serious, a serious photograph, you ask a question of nature. You have to listen. See what she's telling you and go to the next step. It's a beautiful world out there, in my opinion. Beautiful world. Thank you very much.